Welcome and thanks for tuning in. You're watching a special broadcast of the We on VOA co-production with me, Priyanka Sharma. Let's get started. Next week, President Joe Biden is expected to conduct his first one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Chinese President Xi Jinping on the sidelines of the G20 summit. Taiwan sees this as an opportunity to calm down the tensions on the Taiwan Strait and reassure the global community that the supply chain is secure. VOA has this exclusive interview with Joseph Wu, Taiwan's foreign minister. Take a look. U.S. President Joe Biden is very likely to meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping at G20. Do you see open lines of communication between the United States and China conducive to peace and stability across the town street? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, for uh, China right now, uh, we can understand that China has been threatening Taiwan militarily and try to isolate Taiwan internationally. Uh, and they refuse to speak uh, Taiwan's officials. Uh, and therefore, this is a condition uh, or a situation for the international leaders to think about how to resolve the differences in between Taiwan and China uh, and to establish a uh, environment that is conducive to peace and stability in this region. And if the senior leaders or the president, the vice president of the United States are able to speak with the Chinese leaders to address the concerns about the peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait or China's violation of the status quo, uh, I think it's going to be very helpful uh, to the situation of uh, peace and stability in this region. And of course, uh, there's been uh, no uh, official contacts in between uh, Taiwan and China for quite some time. And if the United States is able to address to the Chinese side some of the concerns on the Taiwanese side, that will be very helpful to Taiwan as well. What is Taiwan's message to this, this year's EPEC? Can you update us? Taiwan's efforts to diversify semiconductor production in other APEC economy amid concerns of possible disruption due to a Chinese invasion. Taiwan is a uh, main uh, center for the semiconductor industry uh, production uh, in the world. Uh, for instance, uh, in the uh, high end, the very high end of uh, semiconductor chips production, uh, Taiwan produces about 92% for the world. And this kind of uh, concentration of uh, semiconductor chips uh, production in Taiwan is very important uh, to supply to the uh, functioning of the uh, modern industrialization of the uh, uh, of the international community, and therefore, if there's going to be any interruption to the supply chain of the semiconductor industry, uh, I think it's going to be an interruption for the international economy. A lot of people have been uh, talking about this, including Secretary Blinken, and we appreciate uh, his effort in bringing this to the attention of the international community. I think the important thing is for the international community to ensure the peace and stability in this region and to ensure that the supply chain is not disrupted because of the war. And for more analysis, joining us now is Voice for America's correspondent Jessica Stone. Jessica, thanks for joining us. Now, as we've been reporting, President Biden is in Egypt today for the COP27 Climate Summit. Part of the approach is to create a mechanism to fund climate mitigation for small developing countries. But China says it won't participate. What are the implications of this? Fairly significant, because remember, China is the largest carbon emitter currently in the world. And for the first time now, the climate compensation issue is front and center on the UN climate agenda there at COP27 in Egypt. What has happened in the past few days is that a couple of these small island nations have said, look, we want you to pay more, China, India, United States, to make sure that you're helping us mitigate uh, these issues that we're facing because of the ramifications of the emissions that you put into the environment. Uh, and China is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. It, it in fact, uh, has surpassed the U.S. emissions back in 2009. So for its part, uh, China is saying, no, we're not going to do that. It has already committed to a number of uh, investments into a green climate fund. I believe it's $4.1 right. billion dollars into a climate action fund. Uh, but that's separate from this, Priyanka. Jessica, President Biden is also spending the weekend in Cambodia, for, in fact, for two major summits with South and East Asia. What is he trying to accomplish in those? 
He's really trying to put a face to the country once again, to show that he is physically and permanently committed uh, as a representative of the United States to the region. And he will be meeting face to face with Southeast Asian leaders, unlike the president of China. To our knowledge, there is still no evidence that President Xi Jinping will be attending the conference in person as he is the G20 on the other side of it. Uh, but this is really an opportunity for uh, Joe Biden, the president of the United States, to make good on promises the United States has made to these countries. Remember, there has been a growing closeness with some Southeast Asian nations and the United States, primarily the Philippines and Indonesia, where they have increased military uh, drills with the United States and also committed to purchase military hardware from the United States. And this is also against the backdrop of what's happening in Taiwan. The region is increasingly concerned about conflict in Taiwan, whether it's semiconductors or military conflict that can impact uh, their air, air flights. And just to put a finer point on this, Priyanka, Singapore's foreign minister said last week, quote, the stage is almost preset for miscalculation or accident, the likes of which we saw just before World War I. Jessica, thanks for those updates. We are now going to talk about the U.S. midterms. We'll come back to you to find out where things stand as of now. Let's shift our focus to the U.S. midterms. How did candidates endorsed by former President Donald Trump fare in the U.S. midterms as, voting count, as the vote counting still continues? Voice of America's Michael Sullivan reports. The results were mixed. Take a look. Democrat John Fetterman claimed victory in a tight race over celebrity Dr. Mehmet Oz, who was backed by former President Donald Trump. Fetterman, who recovered from a stroke this year, thanked his supporters for their efforts. And tonight, that's why I'll be the next U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania. The writer and venture capitalist J.D. Vance, endorsed by Trump, won a Senate seat in Ohio over Democrat Tim Ryan. Pennsylvania Democrat Josh Shapiro took the governor's seat over Trump-backed candidate Doug Mastriano. New Hampshire Democratic Senator Maggie Hassan fought off a challenge from Trump-backed Don Bolduc, who conceded Tuesday night. And I'm honored to have had the opportunity to represent the Republican Party in the U.S. Senate race here in New Hampshire. Gretchen Whitmer was re-elected governor of Michigan, defeating Trump-supported Republican Tudor Dixon. This victory reminds us all that our governor's office does not belong to any person or political party. It belongs to all of us. Among those returning to Congress, Trump ally and conservative firebrand Marjorie Taylor Greene, a representative from Georgia, and another Trump ally, Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. Donald Among Trump those not returning, Congressman Liz Cheney of Wyoming, who played a central role in the January 6th hearings that probed Trump's role in the attack on Congress in 2021. Trump. Cheney was beaten in the Republican primary by Trump loyalist Harriet Hageman, who won the general election to replace her. Still undecided, the race for Arizona governor between Trump-backed Carrie Lake and Democrat Katie Hobbs. And the Arizona Senate race between Trump-backed Blake Masters and the incumbent Democrat Mark Kelly. Also undecided is the Georgia Senate race between incumbent Raphael Warnock and his Trump-backed opponent, Herschel Walker. The vote count will determine the composition of Congress and the future direction of both parties. Michael Sullivan, VOA News, Los Angeles. We still have Voice of America's Jessica Stone live with us on the broadcast. Jessica, there's been a lot of soul searching inside the Republican Party since the midterm voting on Tuesday because he expected Republican sweep or red wave, Din Tucker. What were some of the factors driving the results, according to you? Well, political observers are really pointing to the presence of abortion rights on the ballot. It was on the ballot in five states, uh, Kentucky, Montana, California, uh, Michigan and Vermont. And th these were referenda that asked voters to decide whether to protect or reject abortion rights. And what we're seeing so far is that it turned out a lot of young voters, particularly young female voters, people in all of those states decided to protect abortion rights by overwhelming margins. And remember, the top three issues we've been talking about in this election, election have been the economy, abortion rights, and crime. Uh, so this is significant. And I have to tell you, though, the results have really rocked the Trump 
camp uh, because we're seeing reporting from Jason Miller, a former White House advisor to President Trump, that look, you should delay your announcement for next week, which is by all expectations supposed to be an announcement to run for 2024 until we have results in these close Senate races, Georgia, Nevada, and Arizona still uh, being counted. And so it's really not the victory lap that President Trump wanted to take. So he's being advised not to make an announcement next week about running for the White House, particularly after many of his candidates have not done so well in these races. Priyanka? Right, Jessica, how are Democrats preparing to govern? Well, President Biden really reminded people at the White House press conference that tra that's traditional after the midterms that, look, uh, he has a veto pen. He's not going to pass or agree to legislation, even if it is passed by the House and the Senate, that he doesn't agree with. And so he reiterated his values, talking about the importance of Medicare and Social Security protection, health care um, and climate change. But he also said he would try to come to an agreement to, quote, coexist with uh, House Republicans. And that likely means uh, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, who has already begun his race for House Speaker to replace Nancy Pelosi if the House continues to hold the lead in seats. Uh, not all Republicans, though, back him. And that could really create some very difficult situations inside the Republican Party that could impact whether things can be done here in Washington. And remember, we have to fund the government. We have to pass a budget by the end of the year. That is always down to the wire in the last 10 or 15 years, and it will be likely no different this year. We're already on a continuing resolution. So it's really important that uh, that uh, the leadership be established and have some kind of pull with people, or we're going to see things drag out towards the end of the year. And that affects federal workers, and it certainly affects the functioning of the U.S. government. Priyanka? Absolutely. Jessica, thanks so much for all those insights, and thanks for joining us on this special broadcast.